Hello buddy pals! I'm Sophie. Welcome to my channel. Today I am wrapping up all the books I finished in November. Biblio Sophie. I never did an October wrap up and I decided recently just not to do one at all because I talked at length about every single book that I read in October at some point in some vlogs. So we are going straight to November and I'm going to try to keep this short for my sake, for your sake, for everybody's sake. So November was a really good reading month. I had a sort of weird October in many, many ways, including in terms of reading, wasn't super into reading, but November kind of came together really nicely. We have a lot of quiet, atmospheric reads, a lot of domestic reads. I think it's all very appropriate to autumn to kind of a pensive state for me. So let's get to them. The first book I read in the month was Pond by Claire Louise Bennett. Very domestic, very ponderous, very pensive. This is a super short book that I read in just over a day at the very beginning of the month and it kind of set me up nicely for the rest of the month. It's not about anything in terms of a storyline. Uh, this is just a really close portrait of a domestic life of a home um, in a remote seaside village and uh, our narrator's life therein. I think whether you like it or not is very much dependent on what you're looking for in a book. If you're looking for plot, you're not gonna like this one. But for me it was a really nice restful kind of meditation on domesticity and it really set me up nicely. Second book of the month was also a super short one that I read quickly uh, and that was The Hour of the Star by Clarice Lispector but uh, in French, L'Heure de l'Etoile, uh, translated by uh, Marguerite Wuncher. This is a reread for me. I talked about this previously that I liked it a lot more uh, this second time that I was reading it. The first time I read it in an English translation, this time in the French translation, I liked it more in the French translation and I think I just liked it more by virtue of knowing Le Spectre more and of knowing the book in advance. Um, this is nominally about a young poor girl um, sort of living in the slums who has really no story to her name. Uh, Maccabea is her name in fact, is our protagonist but at the same time she's really not the protagonist of even her own life. So it is Le Spectre's um, exploration of what it is to merely be kind of a side character of your own narrative. Um, and as with a lot of the Spectre, it is very much about the act of writing, of storytelling, of asking questions of the world, of finding the sort of growing consciousness of your own self. And Maccabea does this over the course of this super short book. Um, as I've said previously, it's not my favorite Le Spectre, but I still really love it. I read this uh, over the course of a train ride, so all in one sitting, and it was a really lovely, again, sort of meditative, pensive thing to do to set myself up right for the day and for the month. Speaking of journeys, uh, the third book I read, I listened to on audiobook was Journey by Moonlight by Antal Zerb, uh, translated from the Hungarian by Len Rix. This is very much a uh, modernist European novel, um, by which I mean that it is a, about a young sort of bourgeois man feeling feelings and having thoughts uh, while he carouses through Europe. Uh, it's about growing up, it's about figuring out what your role in life is, in your own life, uh, trying to figure out 
who you want to be, what you want to be, how you want to live your life. So he has all of these encounters with different people, a lot of them from his past, from his um, childhood, adolescence, young, young adulthood. He is newly married, but because of events, he gets uh, physically separated from his new bride during their honeymoon trip. And uh, then he just kind of is going through a bunch of places in Europe. Uh, he's journeying. And um, it has a lot to do with our power pasts haunt us, how we think we are positioning ourselves in the world, how we see our future and how our past informs our future, how other people's pasts, how people are imbricated together. Um, it's a deeply melancholy book, sad book, funny book also. It's it's a funny, but funny as in ha ha, but also funny as in weird. It's a, it's a weird tone, which I have previously said on this channel. Um, it's quite dry and sarcastic. Uh, a lot of the plot of it circles around uh, suicide and suicidal ideation. Um, and yet, in this very kind of matter-of-fact dry way, um, so it's an interesting uh, tone to the book, and I really, really enjoyed it. I had a great time listening to it. Some more melancholy domesticity, uh, Un Chien à ma table by Claudie Hansinger. Um, I picked this up at the very, very beginning of the year and finally just read it. Uh, I really liked this. This is about an older couple living um, in a remote uh, kind of woodsy house um they find a dog take her in and build a life as a trio uh so it's about building a bubble for your home um about family it's about aging and the evolution of your feelings towards people that you age with your feelings about yourself uh it's about fear of the world and of um, the, the the disintegration thereof basically and trying to find a refuge from uh, the encroaching world. Uh, there's a lot of nature, beautiful nature imagery and there's a lot of ecological concern in that as well. Really melancholy, ultimately very very sad. Um, yeah. I really love this. This was great. Uh, I don't think it's been translated into English, but if you read French, I highly suggest it. Very good autumn read, I think. Uh, next up was I Fear My Pain Interests You by Stephanie Lakava, also a super short read. Uh, this is about a young woman um, who's kind of a disaster artist. Uh, she is the daughter of two mildly famous um, parents in the performing arts. She herself is in the performing arts and she's sort of part of a lineage of self-destruction, uh, of creativity and self-destruction and sometimes creative self-destruction. It is very much about pain, uh, feminine pain specifically, um, emotional pain and physical pain. I don't want to say too too much about that because there's an interesting twist that you find out in the middle of the book uh, that I definitely did not see coming. If you saw my vlog about this book, I kind of had some um, guesses as to where it might go and was in many ways right, but there's an aspect, just kind of a plot point about our main character that I absolutely did not see coming, which is interesting. Um, yeah, which makes for kind of an interesting um, thing about her. Uh, but the kind of aesthetic of suffering and specifically female suffering and self-destruction, uh, this was 
ultimately really very enjoyable for me. I was a little lukewarm on it at the beginning. It's a very fast read, compelling read. I couldn't quite get into it because I felt pretty distant from our main character, um, but I got into it more and more and it has stuck with me nicely. It's kind of, um, my memory of it is good. So I recommend this one as well. I tell you, I, I've really just had a very good reading month. Uh, another French book, uh, Que reviennent ceux qui sont loin by Pierre Adrian. Uh, this is another book I picked up at the beginning of the year that was published in 2022. Uh, another <laughs> melancholy book. Um, this is about a kind of millennial man. Um, Adrian is basically the same age as I am. Um, and he is going back to his Breton um, f big family home, summer home getaway that he used to go to as a child. And so there's a big kind of family gathering. It's a very normal thing, right? Summer time, the whole family comes together in a place uh, usually that they have a familial attachment to and spend part of the summer together. Um, and you do this as a child and then you kind of stop doing it in your, maybe in your adolescence or in your early adulthood. And then you're a real adult and uh, what happens when you kind of go back. So this is very much, and not much, much happens. Something very major plot-wise happens really towards the end, which I won't give away, but it's very sad. Um, but most of this book is really just about discerning yourself in time passing. Um, it really hit me hard because, as I said, I'm basically exactly the author's age and guess where I spent, actually I'm dressed perfectly for this, guess where I spent all of my childhood summers in Brittany. So there was something kind of gorgeously uncanny for me about reading this. Um, but even if you didn't have that particular slice of French upbringing, um, I think it is very deeply relatable to go back to a childhood family location and how you have changed, how it has changed, and how sometimes neither of you have changed. So it's kind of seeing the ghosts of your past, and seeing yourself as a ghost also in a place. Uh, this takes place in late summer. I would definitely suggest it as a really good late summer book because it is about the that dissolution of summer that happens um, in late August. But also it's a very good autumn book because of how much it is about time passing and the changing of seasons, um, both kind of of the year, literally, and also of your life. Um, another really beautifully poetic, melancholy read. Uh, mais en Bretagne, dans cette terre que j'avais laissé vivre sans moi, qui n'avait pas changé, où de vieux parents se faisaient enterrer, un sentiment beau et douloureux d'appartenance émergeait désormais. Si notre pays est celui où l'on a les plus grands souvenirs, alors j'étais d'ici. Alors j'étais de cette terre entre dunes, champs et bruyères, de cette presqu'île levée entre deux bras de mer. I'll try to spot translate it. Uh, but in Brittany, in that uh, land that I had left to live without me, um, which had not changed, where old parents got buried, a sensation, a, a beautiful feeling a beautiful and painful feeling of belonging now emerged. If our country, if our land is that where we have um, the biggest memories, then I was from here. Uh, and I definitely feel that even though I am not from Brittany, I definitely feel that that connection from having spent so many days of so many summers and feeling that kind of ancestral connection to the land, that kind of Celtic uh, end of the world feeling really lends itself to that kind of 
a feeling of appartenance, of belonging to the land. And we're gonna keep that in mind for future reads. So this was a big success for me also. I said that I would try to read more nonfiction in November, nonfiction November after all, but I only read two nonfiction books after all, uh, the first one of which was Virology, uh, Essays for the Living, the Dead, and the Small Things in Between by Joseph Osmondson. This is a collection of essays about uh, COVID, um, HIV, AIDS, and then more metaphorical viruses of the world and of society, um, how we deal with illness, illness as a metaphor in the Susan Sontag um, vein of things, um, how we treat one another, um, so medic treat as in heal one another medically, but then also how we deal with one another very much about community, um, the intersection of illness, disease, um, ostracism, um, suffering, death, being left to die, and then things like non-whiteness, uh, non-straightness, um, and how that all intersects with community, being at risk, um, white supremacy, all sorts of really interesting um, and important uh, stew topics, uh, and done, I think, really, really well. I really liked this collection of essays and grew to like them kind of more and more as I went through the book. I finally finished Affinities by Brian Dillon. These are a series of essays about art and almost exclusively uh, photography or things involving photography elements. This didn't hit as much for me as um, the other two Brian Dillon books I've read, uh, which I've really loved. So the fact that I didn't like this as much doesn't mean that I disliked it. I found it a little bit boring, a little long. Mostly there were just a lot of individual essays about individual things. And sometimes I was more or less interested in them. But I really love supposed sentence and essayism. So the fact that I like this less does not mean that I disliked it. Um, I liked the interstitial essays. Um, I think they're called On Affinity or Essay on Affinity, number one, two, three, etc. More than the ones considering specific works. Uh, there are a lot of pictures. So you, for almost all of these, you get a picture and then you get a really short, sometimes extremely short, this one is only two and a half pages basically, something between like two and ten pages on that piece, his experience of that piece, but also mostly a lot of background about the artists or the people involved in the making of that piece, and that was to me the least interesting. It took me a while to read. I read um, some good chunk of it in October and then really just kind of finally finished it at, at the end of November. So, you know, uneven but still pretty good fundamentally. The uh, next two books that I'm going to talk about are entries in Irish Lit. The first one that I read was Exciting Times by Nisha Dolan. I have had this on my radar for a little while, but I really felt the push to finally read it uh, because of Kat, who uh, was talking about this and loved it. Um, this was a really great experience. It is really the kind of new release uh, or newer release that I look for that is easy to read, easy to get into, goes by quickly, is relatively fuzzy, fizzy, not fuzzy, uh, fizzy, light, bright, fun, but also not empty. There aren't that many books that do such a good job for me of having that really nice balance of relatively frothy in its experience, but not devoid of content at all. 
This takes place in Hong Kong. Uh, it follows a, I think, 22-year-old uh, Irish woman named Ava who starts a very sort of bizarre love affair with um, an English man who's in his late 20s. He's much richer um, than she is uh, and he, because he's a financier, he's a banker, um, she starts living with him and they sort of have this weird um, relationship. Uh, he goes away for a long time and in his absence she's still living in his place but she starts an affair, I guess, uh, with a um, another person, with a woman from Hong Kong originally, who is also richer and comes from a privileged background. So um, this is a coming of age book, um, a kind of queer story book, trying to figure out what your identity is, very much a book about class, um, about you know, the remnants of um, English colonial past in three very different ways, um, how class and ethnicity and race all kind of come together, how these all interact, and about, you know, uh, gender uh, relations also within all of that. The second uh, Irish book is a reread for me. I read A Ghost in the Throat by Doreen Nee Groifa um, at the end of 2021, uh, but I wanted to listen to it, and so I listened to it as an audiobook, and uh, it was a really good experience as an audiobook. This is a much heavier book um, with less overt plot. Um, it's a book about being a woman, being a poet, being a mother, um, it is simultaneously a sort of memoir of the author as well as her obsession with and um, her investigating a, uh, an oral tradition of poetry, um, specifically through um, a particular poet's work. Um, she says over and over again in the book, this is a female work. And it is very much about woman's work. It is about household tasks. It is about uh, motherhood. It is about telling a story and about oral history, about oral storytelling as a f very kind of female thing, um, not exclusively, of course, but what is the difference between history, book history versus personal history and oral personal history. It's about grieving and that kind of surfeit of emotion. Uh, it's, it was a really lovely listen. I liked this book a lot when I read it. Um, and I, it was really nice to revisit and specifically to listen to it. Uh, it's very intense sometimes and I'm still kind of fundamentally not that interested in motherhood I, or some aspects of it. Uh, so sometimes it was hard for me to just deal with and get into uh, her, her deep desire for motherhood was something that I remember feeling really alienated by uh, two years ago and once again did um, this time around. So that was sort of interesting to track for myself. There's a lot more I could say about sort of the metaphors of uh, the book, uh, but I'm trying to keep this brief so I won't get into it too much. And uh, the final book that I finished uh, just before deadline of December starting was Shifting the Silence by Etel Adnan. Uh, this is another super short book, another book by a poet. This is a short um, musing, that's the word I'm looking for, on Adnan at the end of her life um, about 
the destruction of the world, the, the various currents of political and ecological destruction that she sees around herself, um, the deaths of people around her and the own, her own expiration, kind of upcoming expiration. This is a, a sort of auto requiem to a certain extent. Um, but it's also about the creative process very much, um, about the desire to build something, to form something as an artist and just as a human being in the world. The title I think is really telling, so shifting the silence. It is about silence as nothingness, nothingness that occurs after something has existed. So she's going to maybe once she dies, she wrote this just a couple of years before she did die. Oh, and she died um, in her late 90s. So, you know, she lived a long life, um, but and a storied life. I got myself on a tangent and I forgot where I was going, but you can sense that she is looking ahead at her own silencing once she disappears, but also silence as something that occurs before something is made. Silence before the Big Bang, and most of all, silence as a thing unto itself, something that is not a void, something that is full. Uh, so a deeply meditative short book that I found really beautiful. And in general, to close out a quite meditative uh, month, uh, some of Shifting the Silence also takes place on the Breton coast. So we have a lot of um, Celtic coastline in the past uh, month of reading, a lot of considerations of domesticity. And with that, I'm going to wrap up. I hope you had a good November. I hope you have a good December. I hope I have a good December, reading and otherwise. And yeah, let's close out this year. Ciao.